Half a day and good morning. I'm Adriana Cotero. Thank you for joining me. And here I have Sergeant Tapao as well as um, Superintendent of GDOE, John Fernandez. And it's Wednesday morning, so that means it's crime time. And there's been some recent incidents that um, the community's been following, I've been following, you guys have been there in the midst of it, yeah. right? So um, we're discussing a little bit of the public safety and concerns with that. And um, for those that don't know, on Thursday at JFK there was a riot, and then again yesterday at Teason High. So let's first start with any updates as far as um, students that were taken into custody or? Well, as, as of uh, today, um, again, our officers who responded to the uh, Tizen uh, incident um, generated the preliminary report and um, our investigators from juvenile investigation had assumed the case. And we do know that um, individuals were taken into custody. Mm -hmm. As for the disposition, I haven't received the final reports because this is a lengthy report because mm -hmm. of the uh, you know the amount of um, individuals that were involved. But you know, uh, rest assured, you know um, we are going to work closely with the administration and of course uh, DOE personnel to to address and of course um, find ways in, in mitigating these situations from happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, throughout the island. So it really is. A, 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 it's a community effort, it's a holistic approach in what, how we're going to address mm -hmm. this. So, you know, so this, um, five students were taken into custody, we know that from yesterday, and then two, or three actually, went to GMH. Any updates on those students? So, um, we know we're still getting, this is the one of the, the issues with um, this type of school, these riots that are that are happening, the one with JFK and Antietam. It takes a couple of days to really sort out um, mm -hmm. all the details as to what happened. Um, I know the administrators are be following up on the students, so we don't have a full report as to their condition uh, yet. I think the, what I understood, there was some stitching that needed to, to occur mm -hmm. for the ones who were transported. Uh, but again, you know, that follow-up will happen this morning mm -hmm. as we uh, circle back. Uh, we, we did want to allow the administrators yesterday uh, to gather all the information they needed, uh, do a first review and give me a report last night. And then uh, this morning, allow them, they, there's going to still be a need to continue to, in, to interview um, uh, complete their investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, we know with JFK there was a lot of video circulating, so yes. they were, they were yep. using that. I mean, I, they're, you know, we're, we're kind of caught between this thing where we, you know, we kind of get ho horrified when we see the videos and the actual, you know, things that are taking place. But at the same time, it's been allowed us and allowed the administrators to take a very uh, close look from different perspectives uh, to identify uh, the perpetrators and make sure that uh, the investigation mm -hmm. is thorough and all the students involved in participating or instigating uh, are, are addressed. So uh, JFK and Teton, uh, JFK is uh, you know, further along the way, Teton will be giving us that uh, report hopefully today and then mm -hmm. they, you know, if they need to continue to gather information, we'll uh, allow them the time to do that. Now at JFK, I know that there were some staff that were injured as well, correct? Yes, there were staff that uh, reported uh, you know, some injuries and you know, being involved in trying to break up the fight. Um, you know, we didn't, we worked with them. Uh, you know, they saw the nurse uh, at the school site, uh, you know, they, you know, the the thing about our staff is that, um, and this is a you know for the for the general public, mm -hmm. uh, they hear a lot of criticism about the the school staff and whether there's enough. And you know, obviously we we know that uh, we would love to have more and more um, support, but the issue is uh, for the staff that were involved. I mean, they're putting themselves in, in harm's way uh, by trying to get in there and try to make sure the students are are safe. And so we did have to, to work with them and, and kind of address their situations. But the general sentiment coming back from them is, you know, we did our job. Yeah. You know, our, our, our goal is to keep our, our students safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of them said we're second guessing what they would do. They, I mean, they, they know that it, it kind of comes with high school territory and, you know, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm just very grateful for them for, for doing what they could to intervene and try to keep mm -hmm. it from, from being a, a worse situation. And the, and, the, and the response of the Guam Police Department was really um, the quick response from the two month precinct mm -hmm. command to to assist and of course the uh, the deployment of the the student services divisions um, you know um, school resource officers right. to to assist in this it really um, shows the, the dedication and the commitment uh, to support you know the the needs and and, uh, and of course the safety of the school the the student population and of course the the personnel that work there and you know, I, I, I talked to some teachers and it was like, you know, what do I do in a situation like mm -hmm. that? Same and thing with law enforcement. We're, we are going to, let's just take names and let's, mm -hmm. you know, take account and make sure, assure the safety of the personnel that are there. And pe you know, the community needs to understand that that's a melee that's happening. And, you know, uh, the, the choices that were made in that incident, it really, you know, the direction and everything, how do we address it? it I, you know, I, 
fully support it, um, you know, the staff's decision and everything because they were present and they provided mm -hmm. they provided that presence and it was just an incident that just happened and mm -hmm. it just caught on fire. So And I know that that's been a question amongst people wondering, you know, where were the staff? But yeah. just because they weren't seen in the videos, what we're learning is that they were there mm -hmm. and um, some were injured. Now, um, going back to Tizen, there was about 30 to 40 individuals I'm hearing that were involved. So it was a much bigger. It, it, we, we're still in the preliminary stage. And then again, um, you know, a big, big kudos to um, you know the the principal, Mrs. Sophie, uh, and 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 her staff. You know, um, I was talking to uh, Senior Jerry, who is the ROTC instructor. Um, they were on top of everything, as mm -hmm. it as it you know doing their best to de-escalate the situation. But when you have that magnitude and everything, also uh, you know all sorts of activities happening. Um, there was there was a, there was a great line of communication. There was a great um, support for the triage, and I want to commend the, the triage that was made because. We had GFD um, there yeah. as well, and uh, you know just the, the immediate care that was provided to assess those that were injured and those were affected by uh, TZ and staff. Um, you know the nurse and and of course the personnel who actually provided basic first aid. You know that that's just really a testament of, of, of where they are in, in handling situations mm -hmm. like this. And you know if you get a population like that, and you know it really um, individuals bystanders may become affected by it, but narrowing down on the perpetrators is where we're going at with the investigation. Right, and, um, and I think that's, a, that's, that's it's always, uh, we're always careful to make sure we do case by case, mm -hmm. uh, thorough investigations because you know, what, it, what appears to be happening needs to be looked at more closely to identify who's a bystander, mm -hmm. who's involved. Yeah. Um, what was different about what we noticed was JFK was contained in the cafeteria for the most part. Right. There were a lot of bystanders around there, so that videos, the videos really helped kind of sort through that. With the Tizen uh, incident, it's harder to tell because yeah. they were happening in different parts of the open area. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think at the All end of the day, we're going to have to really gather the statements of some of the personnel who were there and witnessed and, and can identify who actually mm -hmm. was involved versus who was a bystander. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's very important to us. I mean, the issue for us is um, when we look at school, school populations, sometimes we tend to generalize. Like oh these these students all went you know had a, a riot over there so maybe everybody was involved in some way or or a large portion but in reality we're talking about a small percentage of the students who are at the schools um, the others are either I've talked to several students both at JFK and at TZ including my daughter who's a, a JFK student and our chairman who's uh, who's uh, you know has cho has a, both a wife and a, mm -hmm. a child over at uh, TZ and High so we're both as parents concerned yeah. but right. you realize it's a big campus not everybody's there and involved. Uh, so it's important for us to not just generalize and try to, you know, address it as a full school issue, but who are those perpetrators and what are the consequences that need to be meted out to ensure that the rest of the students are, are safe and that we can uh, deal with these particular uh, issues at hand, not just the violence and the fighting, but also this issue that is complicated, which is the alcohol. You know, the causation yes. of everything. And, right. and, 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 and it's really t uh, touching on the topic of, of the influence, you know, um, yeah. the impairment, and of course the decision-making skills. Um, it was, I, w I was asked, you know, about about identifying the behavior and everything, and um, understanding that that decision was already made once the child set foot in the bus to come to school under the influence of alcohol or any other drug. And, and, and again, it really is the decision-making skills of, of, of a particular individual. Um, we at the Guam Police Department, we work closely with DOE. We work closely with Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness in identifying how we can actually target these incidents from happening or prevent these incidents mm -hmm. from happening by providing, uh, providing outreaches and, of course, uh, providing support mechanisms to address issues that these kids are going to. Because we're seeing, we're seeing uh, not just here, but also throughout the other schools that even to include private schools where um, you know, kids come in and they're impaired either through alcohol or any other drug. And um, it really boils down to um, the community understanding what they can do. And, you know, we're, we're going to ask the parents. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this earlier. The parents that do come to these meetings, the PTO meetings, the parents that do speak up, these are the parents that, you know, are, we know for a fact that we can hit them, that they can receive the message. But the parents who need to hear this message, who so need to understand why we're doing and the reasons for mm -hmm. um, our efforts, you know, how do we capture that? How do we, how do we reach out to the to that particular audience and understanding that they play a major part in this equation by being a part of, mm -hmm. of, of their child's upbringing? Because if you look at it, and you know, my wife is an educator, behavior and education work hand in hand. And That's when right. you have when you have kids who just 
are defiant because of they, you know, they want to, they want to, they want to come to school impaired and you know under the influence. It really, it really causes a disruption in education. So, you know, the, the, these are really a small percentage so, of, of what we're seeing. Right, and you both are parents. So, um, in order to prevent, you know, another situation, what are some tips you could give parents to talk to their kids right now? Well, I think that it's important for the the parents to. Um, uh, make sure they have an open line of communication yeah. with their students. And whether or not there were incidents happening, that open line of communication, especially with your high school students. I have a high school uh, student, uh, and the idea is, you know, they want to, they, they often want to talk to their friends or listen mm -hmm. to their music, but you have to try to continue to open those doors so that you can see how they're doing in school academically, behaviorally, socially, and try to keep tabs as a parent. And in incidents like this, really understanding, you know, what choices they're making uh, in, you know, through their day-to-day. -day, um, mm -hmm. And you know, how it can affect them right. later on. Like, well, so, you know, I, like I said, you know, my, I'm glad to know that my, my daughter, uh, during her lunch routine is to um, get lunch, but she usually spends time uh, in the classroom with a teacher who allows them to come in and do mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And so when it happened, I knew that she was most likely going to be in a place that was away from it. A lot of students, you know, have their particular routines. As a parent, mm -hmm. where are you during lunch? I want to, where are you during mm -hmm. the day? Where are you doing your free time? I like to know more about about that because I want to know what what the risks are and who you're interacting with and are you ever in a dangerous situation that I need to know about and uh, need to report you know eventually as a parent. So I I, I want to know that and in this particular incident my focus was on safety. Yeah. Make sure you're watching out for yourself, your friends as well. Don't put yourself in the dangerous uh, situation. Um, you know whether it involves you know, exchanging words with anybody, you know, even sh even walking through the hallway, you have to watch out. Yeah. But that's kind of, that's for me, and, that, and that's really from the preventative standpoint. Um, but I know that what the sergeant's saying is that there are parents that, that need to be involved that who sometimes aren't involved until the tail end when mm -hmm. you've expelled a child, expelled a student, and they come back and say, we really want to beg for reconsideration. And our, our response is, you know, where have you been? This may not have been the first time we've yeah. got an indication of potential risk. But our challenge is you come in at the end, we're talking about students who are close to or at majority age who are making decisions that would get them in jail, yeah. going right. in jail out in the community. And, and we're at the same place as the police department trying to respond to them. And, and, and if you really look at the full totality of the circumstances that happen in both um, incidents at JFK and, 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 and of course these, and these are high school students who are teetering towards adulthood. Mm -hmm. And these are high school students who are committing um, these uh, these, these these acts of violence and these acts of crimes that they don't understand the consequences that happens to them in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you may be a senior that turned 18, you get involved in this and you, you think at that moment, and this is what I talk to my daughter, she's a graduating senior, you shouldn't live your life just based on that moment. You gotta have foresight way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You gotta think about consequences and you gotta think about risk and rewards and what happens with the decisions that you make. So these kids who, who or just these students particularly, who are already adults but are gonna graduate, mm -hmm. they're, they're jeopardizing a lot. If they get arrested, they get expelled, they're losing credits or they only have two and credits to graduate. what could they be charged with potentially? Because I know one student from JFK is being charged as an adult. Yeah, you can be charged with a whole slew of things, uh, you know, aggravated assault, um, you know, um, disorderly conduct, public drunkenness. And this is not straight to the Department of Youth Affairs. You go straight to the Department of Correction. Mm -hmm. And from there, the court adjudication that needs to, to go in, you know, um, it's, it, 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 it's separate because there's, there's different types of approach when you're when you're when you're charging a minor, and you know, minors have all the uh, reform acts to, to help them so that they can progress in life. You've hit the mark already when you're 18. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was I was a 18 year old senior that was ready to graduate and everything, and understanding the the consequences that can happen and will happen if you make those choices, it really does boil down to the decision making. And, and if I could, because you mentioned earlier, you know, and people wonder what the education department's role is and all of this, and said, you know, in elementary and middle school, we've implemented the positive behavior and, and it's perfect and yeah. supports uh, program a curriculum, which really is about uh, incentivizing positive behavior and helping ensure that you know students understand, uh, you know, these are the parameters that are acceptable and these are things that are not acceptable. But we are we offer you as young as young children, our job is to try to correct that behavior and try to, to move them into being you know safe, responsible, respectful citizens. Mm -hmm. The problem is when we get into high school, especially as, they're, as they start to get towards the age of 16 to 18, we're talking about um, sending a message that's, that says that if, if it's not allowed in the community, it can't be allowed in school. Yeah. 
And while we try to do things like substance abuse intervention, we do have a, a school-based substance inter abuse intervention program, uh, tobacco intervention, uh, behavioral health interventions. At some point, when we're talking about acts of violence that put uh, others in, in harm's way, as well as the, the perpetrators themselves getting themselves harmed, mm -hmm. we have to figure out uh, you know, how to send a strong message that that isn't tolerated in school, just as it's not mm -hmm. tolerated out in, uh, in public. And I want to I want to add on to the to the uh, positive effects of PBIS because we at the Guam Police Department are community affairs right we use and we capture the, the the structure and the curriculum of the the DOE's PBIS and every presentation uh, when we're in the primary we we highlight that the be respectful be responsible mm -hmm. and be safe and based on our all everything that we bring into the school we focus on that everything evolves around that so the kids have an understanding that you're learning this in the classroom in the real world responsible choices towards bullying responsible decision making towards peer pressure the safe choice and the how do you respect um, those of uh, different cultures and everything we teach that we, we teach that curriculum in a real world society and moving on to the middle school we we have our fade away from violence where we take the at risk you know I, I try to break away from the at risk because everybody's uh, they, at risk. everybody can be at risk mm -hmm. but our, our, our kids who may be leveled at a tier level where um, they have behavior issues or they have um, you know um, just issues in grasping decision making skills we work with them and we focus the PBAS in a more um, heavy setting base about um, intervention, drug prevention, even suicide, mm -hmm. talking to these kids about this at the middle school level and now they have an understanding in how hey, I learned this in kindergarten and it's still being taught in middle school by the officers who are not even teachers. So that is, uh, you know, the PBIS program, I, I, I for one see it as, as an opportunity in which we're using at the Guam Police Department to help solidify that curriculum and that education in real life scenarios separate and apart from what's being taught in the classroom. And the reality is that it also has to be reflected when they go yeah. home. So that's the con continual work we're trying mm -hmm. to do. Um, it's not just a school thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just a parent thing at, at home or out in the community. It's not really just a police uh, initiative. This has to be a whole community yeah. reinforcement of, of positive behavior. But also, I think at the end of the day, when we're talking about high school students, it's uh, not just the positive behavior, but the choices you're making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said one bad, you know, bad choices now start to have real consequences as you start, as you get towards adulthood. And once you're an adult and you're out of school, those choices become very real very quickly. And mm -hmm. I think if we haven't taught you that by the time you graduate, uh, by the time you turn 18, uh, you're going to have a hard time really adjusting to mm -hmm. to reality uh, after high school. And it's and it, and it changes for them real, real, real quick. So real fast before I ask my next question, um, if anyone has any questions, please tell us right now for all our viewers and we will ask them as well and get those answered. But um, as far as um, disciplinary, can you tell us the process? If a student is expelled, um, what happens essentially? They can no longer go to any other GDOE high school? Right. If you are, so you know, we are re required to provide a public education to students, but, um, and, but there's a caveat there, and, there is, and it's set out in public law as to what the process is for expelling a student from, from a public school. The, the challenge there is that we have worked very hard at the DOE and worked with the police department to try to keep our kids in school. We don't yeah. want them going to DOC. We don't want them going to DYA. So all these, all the outreach, all the, the positive stuff we're doing is to try to keep them in school. Uh, the success academy is to try to keep them towards graduate, getting their diploma um, and all the interventions. So we try to exhaust all those interventions to make sure that we're doing our best to keep kids in school so they can graduate. Expulsion is just your last resort. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to do to be expelled, uh, it has to be recommended by your administrator. Uh, it then goes to what's called a discipline advi advisory committee, right. and that that committee is comprised of students, teachers, uh, the administrators, as well as the central office representatives. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure we give due process to yeah. every student who is being considered for expulsion, and then that recommendation comes to me. Uh, I've made it very clear to uh, our administrators that we are not trying to use expulsion for everything. <coughs> But when it comes to serious acts of violence uh, in the schools, then we need to really take a look at how that authority is, is being used to keep our kids safe. And uh, I support the administrators if they are going to go down that route. They need to make that uh, make that case. But when it comes to me, safety is going to be the paramount uh, priority. And, and I want to stress that in the, the <laughs> intervention programs that DOE has and how we at the Guam Police Department, I, I hope and pray that the kids who go through primary towards the secondary and fulfill the graduation, come out as product stewards of, this, of the society that are going to, you know, 
Koguam their home for, you know, whether mm -hmm. they continue their education or become part of the workforce because the, you know, the lessons that are learned in school and it really, it, it prepares them for the real world. Now, when you get a kid who's expelled and he just has, doesn't have the, the, the means, the resources to get back into the swing of things, they become now our clients. And you see, you, you want to talk about progression in school and, and getting that the, the high school diploma? Talk about progression in crime. I mean, new crimes and everything, petty crimes, and the, you know they continue to commit it because they know that they're juveniles and, oh, my mom's just going to pick me up, I'm just going to go DYA. It magnifies as they get older, but they don't have a sense of understanding of the consequences as they get older. And this is why it's important that all the intervention programs that GDOE has, it, 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 it's, do, it's fully implemented in, in assuring that they did everything because when they step out into outside the realms of the schools and they become now our clients, it becomes a totally different situation when you're dealing with crimes and correction. And if there's an understanding that, you know, sir, had I, had I listened, you know, you know, you came to my school, you talked to us about decision making in middle school, and now he's behind the patrol car, you know, mm -hmm. asking for mercy, telling me that he stood up. You know, they'll, they'll, they understand that. When you ask them their age and they tell you that, oh, I'm 17, but realistically they're 19, they know that, oh, we have to call their parents and everything. So. You see the difference in, 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 in the importance of what they're doing and you know, uh, and their efforts in, 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 in assuring that these kids fulfill what's needed for them for their education because we do, we want products, we want good products, citizens to come out from here and we've seen a great deal of uh, success stories coming out not just from um, the basic, you know, the, the standard schools that um, the kids graduate from, from the respective high school, but also from the success academy that, um, you know, I, I, I want to I say, sir, it really has played uh, a major role in a lot of our efforts when we utilize the students that are coming out from the success academy as mentors into the school system. So great yeah. job on that. I, I also think if you, if you talk to DYA and they'll talk to you about some of the progress over the past few years, they'll say the numbers are down. Yeah. But the, but the reality, and I want to just make sure that everyone's clear, is that it's not down because there's, you know, students are just automatically overcoming these challenges and all making the right choices. It's, it's down because we, we've, we've made a concerted effort not to uh, send these kids right off into DYA at the first opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're saying, how, how can we try to intervene mm -hmm. and address and keep these kids in school and on track? The challenge there, the burden comes back on the teachers and the counselors and the staff to try to figure out what we can do at the school level and continue to do, to try to not send them automatically or, or quickly into that correctional system, whether yeah. it's juvenile or mm -hmm. adult. Because once they get down that track, it's kind of hard to steer them back. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's a balancing act. So. Yeah. Um, I think that's just the, the, the whole conversation is, you know, we know the consequences are significant if a student doesn't get their diploma. Right. That, that lack of a yeah. diploma means that ability to get a good paying job, a stable job, um, to go to college, to join the military, to do things that are productive is going to, that, 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 those chances are going to go, uh, you know, go away. Mm -hmm. And the options there are not going to be good options. And they're going to end up, we're going to see them in the paper yeah. and we're going to look at them. We're going to say, I remember that student. That was my student. Principals have done this. That, that was my student. Um, did we see it coming? Did we not? What could we have done? There's a lot of discussion we have internally. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, um, we have to have that shared discussion about, you know, uh, the fact that we're all in this together. If they don't succeed in school, yep. it's not just the school's responsibility and say, hey, oh, hey, they're out of the school. So it's not our business anymore. We know they're going to be in the village. We know they're going to be running mm -hmm. into the police department or at behavioral health or at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to get other kinds of services that they need to try to address uh, you know, their yep. life choices. So um, we have a, one viewer asking, were the, are there cameras that are installed in the cafeteria? There are not, uh, I, don't, I don't believe there are cameras installed in the cafeteria um, at either school. We do have cameras in certain areas of the campus. Uh, we work to get uh, school security cameras in, but normally the way they're aligned is to protect areas that are targeted yeah. in terms of theft or, you know, break-ins. That, that, that had been the push uh, before. So uh, we don't have cameras in the cafeteria or, you know, to the broader campus. And I think that's, you know, something that I know has been suggested. Uh, yeah. Further either cameras or alarms for, uh, different parts of campus so a lot of comments are also saying holding to hold the parents accountable that yeah. saying the parents are responsible um, do you guys have anything to say in regards to that it, it's like I said they play a major variable to the equation mm -hmm. and uh, you know correction and reform 
It really should, because when you look at a behavior in education, and that's the fundamentals of education, in order for a child to succeed, you got to have the balance between behavior and education. And behavior, um, you know, shouldn't be taught in school. It really shouldn't. Our teachers work hard, you know. Our teachers understand the expectation of what is required from them. And our last resort is really to call the Vaughan Police Department or send the kids to the Department of Youth Affairs. Mm -hmm. It starts at home. It really does. And it may sound cliche and everything, but it be, the beginning of success and the start of success and the, 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 the success of the journey is going to start from mom and dad. Um, we understand the challenges that society faces. You may have two parents, but when you have two parents who work together for the common interest of that specific child, you're going to find a product in the end where they're going to become successful. But you need to establish that. You need, you know, uh, for, we ask the same question. Where are the parents in this? When we get the mm -hmm. parents down, they, they get a, they get they get they get lashings from us because of the fact, hey, where were you? Do you know your child committed this and everything? And you know, there's no halo that's surrounding your child because this is this is real. This is the crime that your child committed. Mm -hmm. Where were you? And you know, this is just the parents in us that are asking these questions towards other parents. Mm -hmm. But you know, the parents need to be involved and they need to get engaged and they need to understand where they can actually provide the assistance in assuring that their child receives the proper education that uh, GDOE provides. Now, you know, I think we've, you know, in our internal conversations, we recognize that, that, that things are changing in the yeah. world. I mean, technology changes. One of the things we had was PowerSchool, which captures the progress mm -hmm. of our students and our parents can check I had it every that day. growing up, I believe. Yeah, yeah so, there, so sometimes parents see and they, oh, we can keep up with the progress, so we don't need to come uh, to the parent-teacher conference. So we're evaluating the parent-teacher yeah. conferences, the PTO meetings, uh, because again, when the parents show up, usually the ones who are there are not really the ones you we need, need to, to talk reach. to. Yeah. And so I think uh, what Sergeant Tapal was saying about the outreach, how do we um, you know, make sure that the outreach reaches the audience that we really care about? And these are not. These are not bad parents. We're not yeah. talking about you know every parent who you know is, is a bad parent. We know we understand that parents are working. They may not have the the necessary time or schedule, uh, and, and making time becomes a real difficulty. Mm -hmm. We understand that uh, you know the challenges that that every family goes through. Uh, there might be domestic situations. You know maybe the there might be you know children out there who are with guardians and their parents yeah. are not in a, in a great uh, great shape or condition. Um, lost their parents, incarcerated. I mean there's all sorts of situations. Mm -hmm. But we know that uh, at the end of the day, the, for the equation to work, there's got to be some adult, positive adult yeah. presence mm -hmm. in the lives of some of these students. Otherwise, we, we, we know when we're in elementary and middle school that if these students are going home and they don't have supervision and they're under the influence of uh, maybe older students who, are not, who don't have their interest in mind, who might take them and introduce them to alcohol, introduce them to drugs, if they start that early and they don't have any, any counterbalancing any adult guidance, yeah. adult yeah. guidance you know, they're already on a track to, when, when they're in high school, not be able to make the right choices. And so, uh, you know, it's it's difficult, but I really appreciate the fact that we don't, we did these outreach events, mm -hmm. elementary school, uh, middle school, trying to, to do specific targeted events and bring the parents out around a positive yeah. uh, interaction. You know, people come out for sports, people come out for performances, you know, they'll come and see their, their, their student. Uh, may not you know may, may not be the same at a parent teacher conference so you got to think about the best ways to, to interact and and reach those who are not really uh, as involved as we need them to be so we have another question on here they're asking if you're in favor of getting rid of the child abuse law since that is why there is no respect by the kids that's what this that's is legislation that's <laughs> uh, you know there's a fine line between discipline and abuse and uh, you know understanding uh, the parents right of, of you know, proper discipline, stern discipline. Um, you know that that again is going to go under legislation mm -hmm. review and everything. But um, you know, we've had calls where you know kids were were just just misbehaving and just outright disrespectful and everything. And uh, you know, taking the full totality of the circumstances, it really um, we're not saying beat your beat your child up or anything, mm -hmm. but find some sort of disciplinary disciplinary mechanism where you can actually uh, be very effective, whether it's um, you know, taking away items such as the phones, you know, restricting them from this. But you've always yeah. got to explain the consequences. You've always got to explain the expectation as to why I'm doing this, why we're doing this. There's always has to be a reason. And I've learned that as a parent growing, you know, mm -hmm. growing with, you know, my kids. You know, I don't just punish them without giving them an explanation or a reason as to why. You know, now I ask my kids, you better give me a reason, don't give me excuses. Mm -hmm. Because now they have to exercise critical thought. They have to understand that, hey, you know, um, I did this this way because 
this is why I did it, you know, rather than giving me an excuse. The same thing goes with disciplining, you know. I don't just outright discipline any of my kids without giving them an explanation and a reason as to, and of course giving them the consequences in the end. So parenting skills, it really varies, but understand that that, yeah. is, that is captured in law, and um, you know, there is a fine line between discipline and abuse. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the child abuse laws, because what those laws are there to protect, protect against the child abuse. Absolutely. But we're not talking about child abuse here. We're talking about mm -hmm. parenting and discipline and guidance. And it may look different than it did, you yeah. know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. I understand and I understand that sentiment. Um, so, but it, you know, so it may be more difficult to make yeah. sure that we're, we're always on the right side of that line. Uh, but you know, child abuse laws are to protect against what truly is abuse. Um, but so, how do we operate now with regard to you know cell phones, technology, uh, the way kids are socializing, the way they interact mm -hmm. at home? We do have to f constantly, as parents, find a way to reach our kids, and it, it's different from maybe mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago. Like you know, the technology already distracts these kids and mm -hmm. my, my own children as well. But you always have to find a way to reach those students, reach the kids about, and help them make choices. So as they get older, you know, when they're younger, you know, it may be more of if I say do this, you do this. But as yeah. they get into high school. I said so. Yeah, we get into high school, the real challenge is when they're off on their own, after they leave the house someday, someday yeah. they're going to have to make these choices. So I, I agree with the sergeant, you know, as they're, yes, they get into that, those, high, that high, those high school years, we have to kind of test their uh, ability to make the right decisions. Sometimes that's going to be making mistakes. You don't want them to be big mistakes, yeah. but you have to have that conversation. And I, I mm -hmm. have that conversation. You know, I'm going to allow you to do these things, but I count on you to make the right choices. I'll be there to support you. Mm -hmm. you ask me if you have any questions. But it's a it's a you know a push and pull to try to make sure that we're creating thinking, you know, citizens that are that your children as they become adults are able to think for themselves, make the right decisions, make informed choices, and that's what parenting looks like now. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of frequency here of critical thinking, and you mm -hmm. know, that's that's the thing that we want to. I I specifically capture when I do school presentations is critical thought into what you do and decision making mm -hmm. skills and from primary to secondary and even to this, con this conversation that we're having with, you know, the, the top brass, you know, the Department of Education, no boils on to critical mm -hmm. thinking and good decision, good, responsible, mm -hmm. safe decision making so skills. I know we've mentioned some outreach, will there be more forthcoming then? Yes, as a matter of fact, I've been working closely with uh, Ms. Stacy Caleta and um, we've actually, uh, we're mapping out, you know, our, our efforts with the Guam Police Department and GDOE has been a uh, you know, the partner then which we can actually capture the audience and um, we're gearing up for our kickball tournament and it's really geared towards um, fade away, you know, the titles fade away from violence, but we bring substance other than just the sport. Uh, we go out to the schools, we interact with the schools and, you know, uh, we talk to the kids about decision making because as a coach, you know, I, I apply what I teach on the pitch to real life about decision making skills. And um, our middle school, we, you know, we're going to continue that effort with our, our middle school kids. And, uh, you know, we're mm -hmm. spinning up a program with, I believe it's the junior police cadet that we're going to, yes. you know, we have a meeting with uh, UOG and the uh, Guam National Guard. And um, this is our, our, our um, pretty much our benchmark and what we did with Department of Youth Affairs. And, you know, we're going to start with five schools, five or six elementary schools, and we're going to continue to work and grow from there. And, you know, with the product you're gonna see is kids graduate from elementary to middle. Now they see the junior ROTC program opening up and evading the services to them and right. they have a guidance and you know, better structure going into high school. Well, let me just say that that, that, that partner is even broader than I think the sergeant is mentioning. So uh, after the kickball tournament that you did before, our, our yep. schools are wanting to build around that. They're saying, hey, that was such a good activity. We saw students and parents that we might not have seen before. Yeah. How can we expand that? It's a recreational opportunity, but it's also a positive behavior opportunity. So that's uh, one thing we're building around. The other thing I don't think we uh, re recognized explicitly, but uh, the prior year uh, when we opened the school year, we had uh, the high five uh, oh, yeah, initiative. The, uh, we had yeah. uh, police officers at some of our, our elementary schools, you know, high fiving students as they came back. And usually, you see a, a cop on campus when there's something bad happening yeah. that needs to be addressed. Uh, so it's very important to have that positive relationship. Mm -hmm. So this year, we said, look, we've got police at certain schools. They, they don't have enough officers to have mm -hmm. to deploy at every school uh, for that uh, morning. So we asked also our partners at the fire department. Uh, mm -hmm. The National, National Guard, Guard yeah. and just really mm -hmm. following in GPD's lead to say we need you know those those uniformed uh, personnel are really yeah. great to have. The kids, leaders, rec yeah. kids recognize them uh, right away, and so we you know to introduce your firefighters, your National Guards, uh, your reserves, uh, your police uh, was really great uh, yeah, this this you. school year. So 
I think that's that partnership we want to continue. And I got, and I just have to say, just to be fully candid, we, just, we have to rec recognize and acknowledge uh, efforts to reach out to groups that are underrepresented, mm -hmm. but maybe highly represented, you know, in the, at DYA and Department of Corrections. So we actually have made in most to, to to try to reach out to mm -hmm. student groups uh, who are less represented. Some of them are Micronesian groups, our Chukis uh, students, because we want the positive leaders in those in those uh, groups to kind of help us move forward. Uh, we hear about the bad news. But there are a lot of positives out yeah. there that we need to harness. We had a forum, a high school forum last last year, and I, I think uh, our partners, our community partners, with Manielo and the Micronesian Resource Center, mm -hmm. are going to hold a second forum, and they're going to incorporate the groups and the clubs that have uh, that, that have actually been spun up as a result from this forum or prior to this forum. And it was a great dialogue about um, you know cultural identity and cultural diversity. So you see how the Department of Education is really. Um, immerse himself in mm -hmm. the changes and you know, of course um, the needs and the demands of, of, of society now that you know um, you know the the eyeball in itself I, I think it's, it, it, it's it's great and where they're going but you know rest assured you know the community in itself that your kids you know they whatever grade level they are primary or secondary um, the Department of Education works closely with the community stakeholders in ensuring the safety and the well-being of every student at every grade level. Right, so Sergeant, what Sergeant Powell is re referencing with our island-wide Board of Governing students, they actually are very involved in policy making yeah. more and more every year. And so uh, this this year's group, which meets with the board every month, uh, has given us input as to, and will continue to give us input on some of the improvements from the student perspective. And then I think uh, the other group we're mentioning is the Micronesian Student Association mm -hmm. leaders. Uh -huh. We bring them in every month to kind of hear what they're doing, trying to support them and organizing around positive events for their peers. If they don't feel they're connected in other ways, there are other opportunities to make sure they are connected and that we're all kind of moving in one positive direction. So again, 1% of these of the kids we're seeing involved in these incidents, there's 99% of the students out there who want to make a difference, who want to be positive, who need adult support and guidance. And uh, you know, we got to make sure that they are uh, you know, moving forward um, and as part of this efforts to improve our community as well. Okay, and I think we will end on that. Thank okay. you both for starting your morning here and right, thank, thank you. you all for starting your morning the KUAM way. Thank you. Thanks guys.